Alright guys, we are starting chapter 16. Chapter 16. This chapter begins by discussing Darwin and his theory of evolution by natural selection. All right, quite a lot of words. We need to break it down. We need to break it down and understand actually what this is and what it's saying. Um, evolution. The word evolve or evolution simply means something's changing. In science class, though, we're talking about a change in, in, um, in organisms or in, in organism, change in organisms over time. Okay, that's what evolution is. Change in organisms over time. Okay. Natural selection. Let's talk about that word. Natural selection. This is the word from Darwin. This is Darwin's word. He coined this, this term. He, he, you know, he's the one who came up with this term, in other words. This, and we'll talk about this term a little later on, probably the next time we talk in more detail, but what it is overall is a mechanism for evolution. What that means is it's an explanation of how evolution happens. Okay. So you need to kind of know these words. By the way, Let's throw one word in, more word in. Theory. Theory of evolution by natural selection. Let me remind you what a theory is in science class. It is different than in day-to-day -day language. This is what I was telling Isaiah Greathouse this morning when um, I was saying, now in, in our everyday language, we kind of look at the word theory as a guess. And I use him as an example, and I said, you could say that my theory is that the Ravens are going to fall on their butt in the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. Okay? okay? That's my guess. <laughs> that's my guess. Okay? But that's how we treat the word th uh, theory in our everyday language. you got to remember, in the world of science, and I talked about this last year, if you remember, theories and laws have kind of equal standing. They're both equally as... They're equally as accepted in the scientific community. They just answer different questions. A law is telling you how an event's gonna go, get, how, to, how an event's gonna take place. If I drop this pen, it's gonna fall. Okay, law of motion. Okay, that's a law. A theory is an attempt to explain an event. Okay, so it goes into more of a detailed explanation about how something took place. They're both equally as accepted in the scientific community. Both of them can be changed over time. In other words, as you know, technology advances, both theories and laws can be changed. Both of them. And this is kind of this is why some people look at the word theory and they think it's kind of like ah, oh, it's like yeah, whatever. It doesn't mean much because it's just a theory. No, that's not it at all. The reason it's called a theory is because in this case, it's a theory of evolution by natural selection. In other words, natural selection is the way, is the mechanism, is the way that evolution takes place. So evolution is the event. Natural selection explains it. That's why this is called a theory of evolution by natural selection, because it's explaining. So that, that's kind of what I want to kind of... Uh, you know, these are the, the big terms involved in, in at least the beginning part of this chapter. So, uh, this whole chapter 16 talks about evolution by natural selection. So, that's kind of it. It's kind of, it's kind of, kind of interesting. And it's not as scary as you think it is. So, um, we'll kind of dig in. Uh, the big name. The big name. Oops. The big name when it comes to the person credited with this is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is the big name. You might have heard of him. 
okay? I'm changing pen colors. Charles Darwin. He is the one kind of responsible. He is the founder of this theory of evolution by natural selection. He's the one who did the research. However, here's what I want to do today. I want to talk about the other people who have actually influenced Darwin to come to his conclusions. Darwin, again, like any scientist, you don't just wake up one day and say, hmm, that sounds good. Write it down, bam. Here's my paper. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that in science. Again, remember, a theory or a law will only become a science theory or law if you have lots of experiments, lots of different people, with a lot of data, and you're all pulling that all together, and you form a theory based on a lot of accepted data. In other words, it's not some random fleeting thought idea that somebody comes up with. So you gotta kind of remember that. Um, so even though this whole chapter kind of revolves around Darwin and his theory, I, I wanna take you on a, like a little history tour back. We, we gotta kind of talk about the people Darwin that influenced Darwin. Okay, hey, it all began way, way, way long ago. Thousands of years ago, Aristotle and Linnaeus. Okay, we actually mentioned these two guys already before, I think, in the last chapter. Remember, Linnaeus was the guy who developed the two-part naming system, the binomial nomenclature thing, and Aristotle. Aristotle and Linnaeus were the first guys to kind of attempt to classify organisms. They were the first guys that wanted to, to, to kind of sort and, and sort organisms a certain way. Now, the thing is, both of these guys... Um, had a very different view of what is accepted now. They, they saw species as being very fixed, never changing, never evolving. They are there, they've always been there, they always will be there in that form, no any change. And that's, that was accepted for the longest time. And in fact, another way they kind of viewed species was kind of like a ladder. They even determined like scala natural. In other words, species Organisms kind of fit in a certain location on a ladder. You know, you had humans up here, you had, uh, you know, bacteria down here, you had everything in the middle. Everybody had their place on this ladder. Um, those thoughts kind of prevailed for the most part. But things kind of started to change in the late 1700s. Now, Darwin wasn't even born yet, so we're not even talking about him yet. There were other people doing some work that uh, kind of got people talking. First guy was the first guy was by the name of Cuvier. Okay, it's worth talking about. This guy was a paleontologist. You guys remember what paleontologists work with? What do they work with? What do they do? They yeah, they like to dig and, and dig for fossils. That's paleontologists too. You know the song I am a paleontologist. Okay, they like to dig, find fossils. Okay, Cuvier was the first guy to really document the fossils he found. When he did this in the late 1700s, he found out that a lot of the fossils in the fossil record were those of extinct organisms, not living today. That kind of threw people off because this idea of species being fixed was now kind of being challenged. They're saying, well, wait a minute, why would they go extinct? Why haven't they always been around? But Cuvier said, well, this is what I'm seeing in the fossil record. This thing's certainly not living today, yada, yada, yada. So he saw that. He also noticed a different pattern. He also saw something more. He saw a pattern. Um, the top layers, hey, remember when you have rock strata, the top layers? Are those the youngest or the oldest rock layers? Youngest. The ones on top. They're the youngest. Very good. He noticed that the youngest layers, the one on top, contained fossils that really looked a lot like living organisms of today. The, uh, not today, of this time. In other words, he said, even though this guy in this top layer is extinct, it still kind of resembles this thing living today. And he said, as you go down the rock layers, though, they look less and less similar to the organisms living today. In other words, he noticed this pattern. So the top layers <coughs> are more similar 
to the living organisms of the time. I'm kind of going to abbreviate. So the top layers are more similar to the living organisms at that time. Bottom layers equals less similar. In other words, there's this pattern as you go through the rock layers of the fossils. They weren't all random. Okay, I mean, this was kind of big news. Okay, but Cuvier, and Cuvier published this. Um, it took a while to publish it, but he published his information and it kind of got heads, you know, people talking. It wasn't until these two guys came around that people really started talking. The next one on the list is a guy by the name of Hutton. Again, I know I'm sitting here throwing a bunch of names at you, but there's a reason. All of these influenced Darwin. Okay, again, we're talking late 1700s. This, this was when this was all going down. James Hutton. Was his, his first name is James. His last name's Hutton. He was a geologist. Okay, if you guys know what a geologist does, they like to dig in the rocks. They like to look at rocks all day. I don't think it sounds like the most exciting job in the world, but apparently geologists love it. They like to go and look at rocks. Um, they talk about this guy in the movie we saw yesterday, actually. When they showed the very beginning of the movie, and they showed this portion of this rock in Scotland, and it looked like it kind of tilted 90 degrees because its striations were going this way, and other striations <laughs> were going this way, and you had some erosion going on. This was the guy who looked at rocks, and he said something extremely interesting and very controversial at the time. He said that um, those geologic features, like mountains and outcrops, so geologic features can be explained, like, you know, where they come from kind of deal, by very gradual forces. In other words, a mountain just couldn't be built in a day. In other words, it took, and this was the first guy to say it wasn't hundreds or thousands of years. It took millions of years for these rock formations to form. Like I said, that's, that's kind of, yeah, it was big, you know, the accepted age of the earth at the time was a few thousand years old. And this was the first guy to come around, and, and he was a geologist, look at the rocks and say, you know what, I don't think so, because it takes a lot longer um, to make these rock formations. Another geologist came around a little after him called Lyle. He was another geologist, and he kind of, he, he further went along with this, and he coined this term, uniformitary. Um, wasn't this one of your vocab words? I don't think so. Maybe not. Okay. Anyway, uniformitarianism. Okay, uniform. Uniform. If everybody wears a uniform. My kids wear a uniform to school. If everybody wears a uniform, they all look the same. Uniform means same. Okay. Um, this idea that he had, he was a geologist. He said this. This is what uniformitarianism is. The same processes of long ago also occur today. Here's what this means. For example, like earthquakes. There are earthquakes today. There were earthquakes long ago. Every time there's an earthquake, it seems to uplift the land maybe eight inches. You give it enough time and that eight inches is going to keep growing, you got yourself a mountain. He's saying the same processes of today occurred long ago and those same processes, those gradual processes are what results in the mountains. Or um, a canyon, you know, Colorado River. If you go out west, Colorado River basically kind of winds and weaves and it basically cuts, There's, it's like a canyon on both sides. In other words, that river flowed for so long, it basically cut out like a knife, a canyon through it. Okay, that's what the Colorado River looks like in a lot of locations. In other words, it took a long time for that to happen. So Lyle said, yeah, Hutton, you're right, because it took a long, long time, not thousands of years, but millions of years for these um, features, these geologic features to be seen today to have existed, and that's basically the same process that occurred today. It's nothing new. So uniformitarianism. And again, 
So these two guys together were basically the ones responsible for, and this was also in the late 1700s, these two guys were responsible for saying, for, for kind of recalculating the age of the earth. And there were some others too. The movie talked about it. You know, there's, there's other people involved too, but these are the ones I want to talk about. Uh, these are the ones that Darwin paid attention to. Uh, Darwin wasn't even born yet, by the way, though, but he read their work. In other words, Lyle actually wrote a book called The Principles of Geology. Very famous book. I know it's probably not anything you or I want to read. I'm sure it's pretty boring and drab, but, <laughs> but very famous. In other words, Darwin read that book, and he was just intrigued by it. Um, Darwin had nothing to do with the age of the earth. You know, he, that was not his research. That was not his research, but his theory relied on the earth being really, really old. His theory would never, ever work if the age of the earth was just a few thousand years old. That's not enough time for Darwin's theory to work. So Darwin paid really close attention to what these guys were saying, and he incorporated, he brought that into his theory. So this is kind of what I mean in science. Like, you can't just think of an idea like that. You have to look at all this research being done all around you and incorporate your explanation based on a lot of factual data from that. So that's what kind of that's how science works even today. All right, moving along. The next guy I want to talk about. <coughs> this one's kind of an interesting case. Jean Baptiste Lamarck. I think he's French or something. <laughs> Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Okay, Lamarck. I, I, I've always known these guys by their last names. It's easier. Okay. All right. Still late 1700s. Up to this point, people were starting to talk, saying, you know what? Fossil record is showing that these species are kind of looking different. Some have gone extinct. Some have kind of changed. There's a pattern to it. Now is the time that everyone's trying to offer an explanation for it. Everyone wants to come up with a mechanism, their own theory on how evolution occurs. This guy was the first one to put one down. Now, I told you, Charles Darwin also did this as well. This guy did one first. Um, his was dead wrong. Okay, And you're like, well, why do we have to learn about somebody whose theory was dead wrong? Well, he was very wrong in some ways and very right in the other. Let me tell you how he was wrong first. His theory, I know you think this doesn't make any sense, but it very much does. His theory was not natural selection. His was something called acquired characteristics. It looks like a big word. It is. Um, this is what it says. And see if you can, when I write it, see if you can figure out where it's wrong. Features are inherited in a lifetime, and I'm underlining that word, oh, I wonder why. <laughs> and passed down to offspring. Okay, yeah. Hopefully you can kind of see it at first glance. An organism, a single organism, Oh, by the way, he used a giraffe as his example. He always, oops, I can't spell giraffe. G-I-R-A-F-F-E, a giraffe. This was his example, because giraffes has long necks. So one of the questions is, well, how did giraffes get their long necks? He was, he was attempting to explain it. This is what he said. He said, all right, long, long, long time ago, giraffes did not have a long neck. They had a short neck. And so you had a neck like about this long. And giraffes noticed that there was some really good food up really high. So they spent their entire lifetime stretching their neck. Well, over the course of their lifetime, their neck went from there to about there, just from stretching every day. Good job. And Lamarck's saying, yeah, you now have an inherited trait that can be passed to your kids. So your kids start off with a slightly bigger neck. They spend their lifetime getting the high fruit. Their necks grow a little bit, and it keeps going like that. Hopefully you guys see the problem in that. You can't will yourself. You can't, like, you know, want yourself to have a trait, so you try really hard in your lifetime to get that trait and expect it to be passed down to your kids. It's like saying... It's like me sitting here doing the problem. You mean to sit here trying to reach and just keep reaching. Exactly. And, and, like, your arm gets bigger to try to reach it, and you expect it to get bigger, and then that trait gets passed to your kid. Fly. That's exactly It's not going to happen. Or it's like saying, you know, Robbie here can go 
take a bunch of steroids and work out in the gym for the rest of his life and become huge. And then when he has a kid, his kid's going to pop out of the womb looking like that. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> not his womb, I'm sorry. <laughs> his kid's going to pop out of a womb <laughs> looking like that. <laughs> but this one, this is this guy got laughed at. I mean, he really got laughed at, which is a shame because, you know, everybody around him is going, they're such an idiot. How could you come up with that? But here's, here's why he was right in some ways. He was the first guy to link the way an, orga an organism looks to its environment. In other words, he was the first guy to say, you know what? Organisms kind of look a certain way and their environment has something to do with it. Whoa. That was a new idea. Very new idea. And that was a very controversial idea. But... That was where he's very right. Also, he also said um, species are not fixed. In other words, he was also yet another person to say, you know what, species have not always looked the same. They have changed through time. And again, whoa, that was pretty big at the time. Darwin hasn't even been born yet, by the way, again. But again, Darwin has been paying, has, will be paying a lot of attention to these people. Questions so far, guys? Pretty interesting stuff? Or? <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. Let me go through one more person before I get to Darwin. This one won't take that long. Thomas Malthus. This guy had a lot to do with Darwin's theory, so i got to bring up this guy. This guy did a lot. He must have liked numbers. He did a lot of population studies. This was the kind of guy for his job. He would go out in the um, environment and do a lot of counting. He would count how many in that, you know, how many trees exist in that area and how many squirrels exist in that area. He did a lot of counting. Okay. You would think it would be the most boring thing in the world. What date was like? Oh, late 1700s. We're still talking late 1700s. Thank you. This all happened like 200 years ago. Okay. 200 years ago is when there was just this explosive boom and, and wanting to seek this knowledge. Okay. Anyway. This guy said this, that Darwin got to thinking big time. He said this, um, if a population, it didn't matter what kind of population it was, whether it's trees or oysters or whatever, if a population is left unchecked, means like if nothing bad ever happens to them, it would grow out of control in numbers. Okay, well think about this guys. Think about maple trees. You know, maple trees produce those seeds that have the little helicopters on them. You guys see them, they're awesome. Think about if you have a maple tree in your yard, if every one of those helicopters turned into a new maple tree, those maple trees would grow up and if every one of the helicopters on every one of those trees would turn into maple trees, what would happen? All in the we would all be a mile deep in maple trees. <laughs> okay? But this guy, yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Is that, like, is that like deer season when they have to kill more deer and then kill less deer? Like this year we could kill like four or five. Next year, some Next year it's only one. Absolutely. That's exactly how it has to do it. They, there are actually people who track the numbers, probably did this, the same thing that Malthus did, to track the numbers to figure out how what kind of population sizes exist for your guys' hunting pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> so anyway, um, what kind of things, will you guys tell me, what kind of things make it not possible for a population to do that? And we can talk about trees or anything. What did you say? Predators. You've got things like predators that keep numbers in check. What else does? Hunters. <laughs> got kind of laws along. Vehicles. Yeah, vehicles. Now I would even lump that with predators. Things that you know intentionally knock them out. Predators. <laughs> um, what'd you say? Disease. It does. Seriously, disease would take out a lot of deer. Keeps the numbers in check. <laughs> Um, yeah. um, what about like climate? Drought. Okay. Different kind of climate changes, like you know, drought. 
Okay. Limited resources, food supply. You know, those kind of things keep populations in check. So, but but um, this is what Darwin, Darwin saw this and read this guy's book and said, hmm, I wonder why certain organisms make the cut and certain organisms do not. He was saying, is there a pattern to why some organisms, you know, fare well and survive and the other survival. ones get taken out? Yeah. So that, that was kind of what he saw when he was, he was doing this. So, okay. Moving along. Now we're time to talk about Darwin. I know I'm talking a lot today, guys. Bear with me. It's not that, ex you know, not that, you know, torturous. Charles Darwin. I know you guys have probably heard about him. You guys know anything about him at all? I heard the words we're talking about being on Texas. Okay. Hopefully it will. It will be. Bear with me. Some of them will be. Darwin's theory of natural solution, evolution by natural selection. What'd you say? I remember this guy by Chucky because they call him Oh, okay. Chuck, Chuck Darwin. Yep. Charles, don't you know? Uh, do you guys know where he took a famous trip to? Paris. Africa, no. Oh, Africa. Europe. Okay, no, no, he's on a boat. Was well, it starting? Not a boat, no. Okay. Galapagos Islands. Galapagos Islands. Yeah, Holy crap. Very good. Galapagos Islands. Somebody had to help it. Do I have the notes somewhere else or something? I'd be impressed, doesn't matter. Hey, look at that. A little bit about this guy. This was the guy, okay, by the way, he was born in eighteen oh nine. 1809, that's when he was born. He died in like 18, oh, I think it's like 1885 he died. In. He lived, he lived a long time for people back then, but he was also part of the upper class. His dad was a doctor. Okay, so Charles Darwin as a boy, this is an interesting story, as a boy, when he was like your guys' age and younger, he was one of those kids who liked to go outside, you know, eat bugs and play in the dirt and fish and hunt and do all that. He didn't like school. Okay, he wanted to, he was a naturalist. He was a, he was like a boy scout of the day. <laughs> Zach told me he does. I said, you are lying. Wait, what did he say? He said, I don't think anybody likes school. Zach told me he does. I mean, he has to be lying. Oh. Anyway, his dad got mad. You gotta understand, his dad was uppity class. He was a physician. He's like, no son of mine is going to just spend the day fishing and hunting and being a lazy good for nothing kid. He sent him off to med medical school. Okay, he sent him off to medical school, and Charles is like, so he went to medical school, hated it, hated it. Well, one of the reasons he hated it is because when you were in a doctor at the time, there was no anesthetic back then. Oh. So you were performing surgeries on people without anesthetic. And Charles Darwin, he was like a tree lover. I mean, he was like a nature lover. He had a hard time with that. He said, no way, no way. He quit. He left. He left the... Um, he left the medical school and he joined the clergy, which is what, you're like, what? Which is what every, upper, the upper class of society were all very affiliated with the clergy. A lot of scientists very affiliated with the clergy. Everybody. Everybody was kind of affiliated with the clergy. That was very much part of the, the world, society back then. So he joined the clergy, loved it. And he, um, his mentor is a guy um, that really that gave him the opportunity to go on a boat ride on the HMS Beagle. I know, isn't that a weird name for a ship? HMS Beagle is the name of a boat. It's a dog. Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh my dog. And the whole point of this trip was it was a, to map the South America, SA South America coastline. In other words, that was the point of the trip. But think about it. They brought Darwin along. Why? They were going to be gone for five years. This was a trip from 18, oh, I should know this, 31 to 1835. It was a five-year trip. And they saw Darwin and looked at him and said, you know what? You might be of use to us. Why? Well, based on what I just told you. He was up class. He was an outdoorsy guy. He would be able to help them out with what to eat, with what to hunt, with what not to eat, with, you know, all this stuff. So they brought Charles along. And Charles is just like, cool, I get to dig in the dirt somewhere else. So he actually used this as an awesome opportunity to go with them, even though the main point was to do some mapping. Um, they went around the globe. It was like a, a round the globe kind of deal, but a lot of what Charles Darwin's research focused around were the Galapagos Islands, and in particular, a bunch of finches, which are birds. Okay. 
the Galapagos Islands, guys, real quick. I want to show you guys some pictures, and because I'm I'm kind of tired of talking to. I've been talking a lot today. If you think of this as like the Galapagos Islands, you had different species of finch living on each island, and they differed. Their beaks were different, and their beaks were different based on the food source that was available on that island. Darwin found that interesting. He's like, that's weird. They're all finches, and they all look alike in a lot of ways, but their beaks are different, and their beaks seem to really fit with the food they're eating. It's, it was almost like too good to be true. And he wondered, and then he also noticed something else, though. <clears throat> He also noticed that these finches were also similar to the mainland finches in South America. In other words, he said, okay, not only are they similar to each other, but they're similar to the finches from the mainland. By the way, let me, I think you guys have seen this little globe. This is where the Galapagos Islands are. They are off the west coast. Oh, this is South America. This is North America where we live. We got the Galapagos Islands off the west coast of South America. So he said, not only are the birds kind of similar to each other yet different, but they're also similar to the birds over here. Not over here where he was from, but here. And he's like, well, they probably somehow found a way to get over to these islands and then kind of changed once they were at the islands. So he's putting all this together. He's noticing, you know, a lot of, a lot of, it's, um, yeah, a lot of just similarity yet differences in these finches. Hey, let me do this. We're done with notes. Let me show you some pictures real quick. Kind of make this more real. Pictures are always good. taking forever on anything we covered. I know it didn't seem like the most exciting thing. Remember, I, I kind of threw a lot of names at you. The whole point of that was to teach you that, you know, Darwin's theory was shaped by a lot of people's work and a lot of people's ideas. It wasn't really his own um, in some ways. He was, he was kind of piggybacking off of a lot of other people's data. Whoops. A lot of other people's data. That's what we'll talk about. That's a, that's, a, that's that's a great. Hey, by the way, um, Kirsten just asked a great question. She said, "If you can't will yourself to change, like Lamar said, then her question was, well, how did these finches change?" Ooh, hold that thought. We will talk about that the next time we talk. Adaptation. That's yeah. It's it's kind of a that's what natural selection is, and we'll go in. It's actually more simple than you think. Hey, uh, this kind of is a timeline. I pretty much talked about all the people, Malthus, Lamar, Cuvier, Hunt, and on, these, on this timeline. Um, you know, we have Darwin traveling around the world around this time. He writes his book. He gets published. That's not him up there. That's a different guy. Um, it is kind of interesting to note that there was another guy doing the same research Darwin did, just on a different set of islands. His name is Wallace up here. The reason they put his picture up is because we were almost not talking about Darwin. We don't well, we should be talking about Wallace because Wallace almost beat Darwin to the punch. Okay, Darwin did the research first, wrote his paper, but I'll be honest, he waited a long time to publish it. Darwin was kind of afraid. He knew. He knew that his publication would cause kind of a stir in the community. Because it kind of went again, went against what the the normal way of thinking was back then. 
this guy came along, almost um, took over, took his pride or his go his research, got the credit for it, and Darwin decided at the last second that he should publish, or else he wouldn't get the credit for it. And he did. Um, that's not him. Uh, let me show you a picture. Yeah. This is the trip he took, the red line. He started up in Britain, bam, 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 went on here, blah, 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 went around the globe, went back home. He went clear around the globe. He went clear around the globe. Five year trip. In a boat. That's Darwin, by the way. You know? Again, he was very upper class. Very upper class. That's a well to do person. He was he was fine whining and dining with the uh, with the rich people. Very much so. And he was very, very well respected at the time, even though certain people gave him a, kind of a hard time for some of the things he was saying. That's a picture of the Galapagos Islands. It's kind of neat. You have some big islands, some little islands. Hey, in four years, the class trip's going to Galapagos Islands. Kind of cool. I know you guys won't be here, yeah, but... Yeah, four years. But you just told us when we watched that movie, though, that it was going to oh, be our senior trip. I thought it was, but I found out it was in four years. Oh, thanks. You know, I know. What's our senior trip? Then? Yeah. Hey, this is the picture of the boat. Could you imagine spending five years in this boat? No. <laughs> and this is probably why they hung out near the coastline a lot, because that boat would, you know, you'd go stir crazy, so they'd hop and hop and hop and let's go here and let's hang out here and then all that. Um, oh, picture, couple, couple pictures of the birds. I'm going to get cut off by the bell here in a second. One of the fish, Eeks cassis, look at its beak. Perfect for diving into that cactus. Insect eater, still a finch, slightly different beak, perfect for eating insects. Seed eater, giant fat beak, can crush those nuts. Perfect for eating. All different birds, all different <laughs> islands. All, what did I say? Something bad? Crush those nuts. Crush them all. Great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody else was laughing. Yeah. I know. I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have even asked. <laughs> and, um, and that's it. That is it. So that's what I mean by the finches. So.